Above all else, I think that the number one thing that Top Gear as a program, along with the BBC, need to realise at this point is that the Top Gear name is basically mud. The show needs to stop living in the past, coasting off of previous successes and endlessly readapting and perverting the format devised by Clarkson and Willman far beyond its original intended shelf life. Otherwise, sooner or later it will find itself on the chopping block and no one will mourn its loss. Well, barely a month after I first published this video and it looks like the BBC may very well be looking to give Top Gear the chop. Though they tried to remain silent about the whole ordeal for a much longer time than what was really necessary, the BBC have finally come clean and officially announced the news that many have expected for over a year now. The show very much appears to be over. Naturally, I don't think this is the complete end of Top Gear in its current form, as of course they'll have material they've been sitting on for well over a year that the BBC will then want to try and bring to air. But given that they've remained eerily silent for the time being, it seems all but inevitable to me that Top Gear will most likely be cancelled regardless of what the Beeb are currently saying to try and save face with. With the latest update at the time of recording being that Freddie Flintoff has just received a £9 million settlement from the BBC due to the injuries he sustained in late 2022. Even after giving a couple extra weeks for the news cycle to filter through official channels, the BBC still seems oddly hesitant to just give a straight answer, with further headlines from the BBC themselves claiming that they remain committed to the current broadcasting team despite the fact there is realistically no way for them to continue. The corporation of course insists that Top Gear somehow can and will continue, but with new evidence that has come to light in recent weeks in regards to the extent of Flintoff's injuries, it just seems very unlikely at this point and somewhat in bad taste. With all the best will in the world, you have to recognise that Top Gear is on the ropes, and not for the first time either. Whether it was Evans' mind-numbing run as a preachy, abrasive know-it-all who actually knew very little, LeBlanc's positively catatonic run that the BBC had little interest in trying to make viewers interested in, or this more recent form of what has essentially become a Top Gear cover band with a very skilled frontman and his two PR sidekicks. The show has just not been able to get itself into the televisual flow state that it needs to be in to please not only its viewers, but the BBC. During its present run over the past four or so years, Top Gear's had an inconsistent and sporadic presence on television to say the least with two full years separating series 24 from 26, comprising a run of just 18 episodes, along with series 27 through 33, seven entire series, being made up of just 37, yet airing over the course of three and a half years. To reiterate a point I made in my previous video, part of why Top Gear worked is that they were constantly on our TV during the trio's formative years on a regular bi-yearly schedule. In a window of 800 days, which spanned from May 2003 until the summer of 2005, Top Gear managed to produce over 50 episodes featuring Clarkson, Hammond and May across just four series, practically double the production rate of the current presenting team. This was advantageous for a number of reasons, as it helped to build their screen presence in not only the UK, but foreign territories where channels such as BBC Prime and BBC World would split the episodes up into smaller parts and broadcast them throughout the day. And by doing this, Top Gear built itself a bit of brand familiarity. On the online car forums that helped to build Top Gear's international reputation early on, there was a constant influx of new material for fans to amateurishly record, cut up, and then show their hundreds of online internet pals from all over the world, who in turn would show it to their friends. From these clips, people then began to record and share entire episodes, and from there, entire series. This eventually led to Top Gear getting all sorts of lucrative international TV deals it otherwise wouldn't have had. It's something that deserves its own video, but the online piracy scene was instrumental in proliferating Top Gear across the internet and directly helping to turn it from a cult hit into a worldwide juggernaut, and that's regardless of what anyone from Top Gear's official camp may state otherwise in a bout of ill-advised historical revisionism. By sticking to a lower budget and cranking out episodes as quickly as they could, Top Gear built itself a loyal, dedicated fanbase. But with the show eventually reaching the dizzying heights that it did, its cumulative audience of 350 million people watching with sadness and awe as an era sadly drew to a close in the summer of 2015, the BBC finally saw the potential that Top Gear had actually had for a long time. 
with its guest appearance on Phineas and Ferb, its tie-in short movie with the Lego Group, and of course its worldwide simulcast deal in the immediate 12 or so months leading up to this moment, perhaps all signs that the BBC had finally recognised what it had so callously dismissed for so many years. And although the damage had already been done by a select few control freaks at this point, wanted whatever that replaced it to maintain Top Gear's status as much as possible. Fundamentally an almost impossible task, but one they wanted to achieve regardless. As unbearably bad Chris Evans was as a presenter, I cannot imagine just how much pressure was on him and the team he'd assembled to deliver a show even one-tenth as compelling as what it aimed to replace. The BBC wanted immediate results, and when it invariably didn't get them, they thought they simply hadn't tried hard enough. And with the BBC now fully behind their new team in the wake of Better Six's total collapse, they tried every trick in the book to make the new Top Gear look as big as possible. They played musical chairs with its own network, guaranteeing zero competition with its former station to maximise its viewing share, as we saw when they got their biggest ever viewer ratings when BBC Two was busy airing a decade-old rerun of Michael Palin's various adventures from around the world. With no more live shows bolstering an additional chunk of profit that Top Gear would traditionally make in a year, they now relied solely on licensing profits and proudly touted the train wreck that was Series 23 was Top Gear's most successful series yet, before kicking him to the curb and starting all over again, because when you make the programme's most successful series, the BBC obviously doesn't want to see your face ever again. They got online reviewers who had never published a review on Top Gear's Rotten Tomatoes in their life to do just that and probably did a whole bunch of other shady stuff to make sure Top Gear came up smelling like roses and the Grand Tour smelling like manure. The BBC and any potential co-conspirators such as The Guardian or The Daily Mail desperately tried to foster a narrative that Top Gear was this new, improved, hip formula that left its ageing contemporaries in the dust, to the point that even its own hosts freely huffed the foul-smelling copium they were producing, whether they actually believed it or not. And because of these constant delusions of grandeur, Top Gear spent several years ignoring an elephant that had only got bigger as the years went by. And that's not only was Top Gear's audience nowhere near as big as it had been many years earlier through many observable metrics which I highlighted throughout my two hour long documentary, but that people no longer cared about Top Gear in its current incarnation. And with a slew of bad publicity over the last seven years, Top Gear's future is certainly not only in jeopardy, but in its death throes. For a start, the programme has now been off the air for the better part of a year, and will likely continue to be gone until at least the beginning of 2024 at the absolute earliest. Top Gear is not a programme you can make in your own front room, to put things bluntly. Richard Hammond's accident, as severe as it was in addition to the fact he was not in the best of health to have continued doing what he did, only derailed Series 9's airing by a mere three months, not to mention was on the back of a surge of popularity. There was a clear heightened demand for new Top Gear, and the BBC reacted appropriately and minimised any further setbacks, which certainly helped Top Gear to reach the heights that it did. Had they gave Hammond a full year to physically and mentally recover, it's likely all that steam Top Gear would have had would have been lost. In comparison, Series 34, which was originally slated to air in March of this year before being delayed to October, looks like it won't be airing after all. With ratings hitting a noticeable slump after 2021, I'd be very surprised if the BBC renewed it at all, and even if they were thinking of airing the new material, would likely consign it to a one or two hour long special on iPlayer, as opposed to actually airing it on TV, in order to write off as much as they possibly can at this point, without disrupting any of their other tight schedules. I said it in my previous video, and I'll say it again. Top Gear in its largely unchanged 2002 format is a televisual dinosaur, its subject matter and presentation style all date back to things originally pioneered by Jeremy Clarkson and Andy Willman potentially as far back as 1994, with the specials the team ended up making drawing their DNA from Motorworld and the subsequent home video specials Brian Klein helped to direct during the 90s and early 2000s, back in the days when a certain someone was still stacking clothes at a branch of Next. With several of Top Gear's key parts now verging on 30 years old, it's no wonder it's struggling in the face of newer content, the Grand Tour realised this and from its very inception, whether forced to or not, made broad, sweeping changes to its format that not only benefited its hosts, but also helped to prolong its relevancy and success far better than the BBC have managed to do. As things presently stand, you don't need to be Nostradamus to see that Top Gear's end is almost certainly nigh at this point. 
I think it's patently obvious the BBC have been having very serious discussions over the future of Top Gear behind closed doors, and that of course includes its possible cancellation. Part of what makes it really difficult to accurately assess Top Gear's future is certainly due in part to the broadcast model employed by the BBC. On a traditional TV network, particularly in the US, a TV show is renewed based on the momentum it's able to generate from season to season, with even the greatest TV shows eventually succumbing to seasonal rot, aggravated by shrinking ratings, a shrinking budget, and less advantageous time slots. But with Top Gear this never really happened, with any slump in ratings during its golden years attributable to more external factors such as the BBC rather boneheadedly scheduling its 15th series to coincide with the 2010 FIFA World Cup, and the 20th series airing at a point in the year that not many people expected it to air, given that it was only 3 months after series 19 and didn't have any specials. And as we've already seen, things rarely ever get cancelled on the BBC. Unless your channel controller really has it out for you, shows in the UK have a tendency to carry on regardless if its lead host gets cancelled, fired, or even passes away during its production, leaving it to run on for years or even decades after its original driver has let go of the steering wheel and its last embers of cultural relevance burn out. The one thing that is principally keeping Top Gear alive at the moment is that the name Top Gear remains very popular the world over, and is certainly the foremost recognisable brand throughout all of automotive journalism by a significant margin, which is why when the TV show was first pulled back in 2001, the magazine continued completely unaffected. Back then, said magazine had a readership comfortably over 100,000 readers, which eventually doubled once the show hit its post-survival peak at the tail end of the 2000s. The name Top Gear was powerful enough on its own even without a TV show, and the BBC knew this to the point they didn't allow the team led by Richard Pearson over on Channel 5 to take the name for themselves, hence why Fifth Gear was created as a compromise. And you can definitely tell from the resultant viewing figures later that year that Top Gear still had that extra bit of pull. Ultimately, the BBC were totally right to keep their hands on their property. Whether they knew it or not, by letting the people who cared about the programme and were willing to pull it in all sorts of exciting new directions, reaped the rewards they had sown. And even in more recent years, and despite the company's best attempts to whitewash the programme from its very history books, Top Gear remains quite unmistakably one of the BBC's largest golden geese. Otherwise they wouldn't be producing cheap cash-in DVDs featuring people who haven't worked on Top Gear in close to a decade, or constantly renewing what must be a very costly streaming license with companies such as Amazon. The cultural impact Top Gear left on the global TV landscape is utterly humongous, and without the creative minds behind it, automotive media would probably look very different had it never came to fruition. But even with that said, I haven't spent the past seven to eight years of my life deeply researching and disseminating the very history of Top Gear and associated media productions just to tell you the same things everyone else will invariably tell you. Because it wasn't just that. Top Gear without the likes of Angela Rippon, Noel Edmonds, William Woolard, Chris Goffey, Sue Baker and all the other hosts who helped to build it into a cultural phenomenon in the pre-Clarkson years might not have been as much of a success without them, at least not without Derek Smith's life-changing revelation which led to the programme's inception in the first place. Throughout the 80s and 90s, with a new team of producers behind the wheel, particularly John Bentley, Top Gear were able to build a very stable and recognisable foundation once that previous generation of hosts fell to the wayside, and the likes of Jeremy Clarkson and Tiff Nidell rose to supremacy in the 1990s. With computers and access to information becoming increasingly commodified, the more journalistic approach that Top Gear took for granted in its previous years needed to go in favour of entertainment value with a more refined edge which channel controllers such as Alan Yentob revelled in. But it's this insistence on sticking with its entertainment value, which certain media outlets decried was what caused Top Gear to stall so dramatically, at least from 2016 onwards. This latest mishap, in spite of all the damage control, only helps to portray Top Gear and the BBC as these faceless, heartless monsters who would rather a man die in the name of making entertainment than to simply take things down a notch or ten to ensure the safety of its hosts. As things stand, Freddie Flintoff is lucky to still have his life and most of his faculties intact, but as you can clearly see, he is not and will likely never be in any condition to continue working on Top Gear ever again. For all intents and purposes, Top Gear is likely over for good unless they can bring on board yet another host to serve in Flintoff's stead. And that's not even their biggest problem. 
Though production shifted away from Surrey quite a while ago, Dunsfold Aerodrome is about to suffer the same fate as many racetracks which are unfortunate enough to have housing built near them. It was never supposed to be a permanent facility. Given how Top Gear wanted to set sail for Enston, the home of the Renault Formula 1 team as far back as 2004, and in the early 2010s was already set for demolition with Google sending around its Street View cars, as well as a laser accurate representation appearing in both Gran Turismo and Forza. The fact that it managed to survive an entire decade thereafter with some change on top is nothing more than a testament to the incompetency of the British construction industry. Without that track, Top Gear have not only lost a good part of their long-term identity, but they've lost a very helpful convenience which the programme took for granted. A good reason Dunsfold persisted as Top Gear's home for so many years, despite its many inadequacies as the show got bigger, is because of just how cheap it was to film there. Furthermore, due to the more or less constant presence of aircraft, they could lend the airstrip out for other productions such as the comedy Come Fly With Me, which gave further use to the airfield, as it helped to subsidise the production costs of these series and justified its continued existence. With Dunsfold no longer an option, any future episodes of Top Gear would need to negotiate with owners of other test tracks, something which is bound to cause them headaches financially as well as logistically, unless you're a test driver for McLaren, in which case booking a track is for suckers. But if they'd like to continue, they'd need to negotiate those places for far more than just a fun day or two. They would need a place they can book out for several weeks or even months on end to produce the content they need without any hindrances getting in the way. And without Dunsfold, they're in deep trouble. I just don't see them being able to do it. As things stand in 2023, Top Gear has lost so much of what helped to make it shine in the 2000s, to the point I'm not entirely sure why they're continuing to persevere. It's lost its hosts, it's lost its balls, and now it's losing the final scraps of what remained of its identity. It barely even has a magazine anymore, just some mass-produced slot behind a shiny cover because the few thousand people who still read it have yet to give things up and have, by manner of proving my earlier point, decided they'd rather stick with an established name over trying out a more passionately produced publication that perhaps caters to their individual interest in cars far better. And when you add all that up, there's no other way to describe Top Gear's current situation as not only being on life support, but already past the point of any reasonable salvation. Now that we have a greater understanding of the situation surrounding Freddie Flintoff, I really do wish the best for him and his family and I'm glad he's alive at least, with absolutely zero malice on my end. With the BBC strangulation and total media outage on his condition for more than half a year, there was no way for anyone to adequately judge just how much damage had been done, outside of trite speculation. Given this wasn't the first time he'd been involved in a nasty accident during Top Gear's production, I feel he should close the Top Gear chapter of his life and move on while he still has the opportunity to do so, and never look back. Whether the accidents he suffered were his fault or not, that's irrelevant, and it seems clear that the BBC did not take adequate steps in making sure Flintoff was as protected as possible. In a year where we lost Ken Block in a low-speed snowmobile accident over anything else he did, Safety should have been the BBC's number one priority. But in saying this, the main problem is still being ignored, and that was Flintoff's appointment in the first place. People like Freddie Flintoff and Paddy McGuinness should never have been within five miles of Top Gear, ever. Until recently, car shows exclusively hired people like Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond, James May, Tiff Nidell, Sabina Schmitz, Tanner Faust, and so many other names for a very specific reason their heightened driving ability over the majority of the population on top of their underlying expertise. But the problem with hiring people like these is that you're not always guaranteed terrific on-screen charisma, especially if they're not used to being in front of a camera, and you need the time and patience to properly allow them to break into their own character. The BBC departing from type by hiring career entertainers and people from outside the world of automotive journalism like LeBlanc, McGuinness and Flintoff whilst demoting those who were of that background, like Chris Harris and Rory Reid, to being mere comic relief and fodder for the other presenters to make fun of, is proving itself to be nothing more than a short-sighted, corner-cutting level of incompetence that has yielded adverse, undesired and above all else inconsistent results. If it were that easy to make a car show without the people who actually know about cars presenting it, every network across the world would be doing it. The fact that no one has yet died from the BBC's many mistakes is a miracle, quite frankly. 
As things now stand, the BBC have found themselves in a position where they need to provide some answers, not only to fans of the show and the greater British public as a whole, such as why they decided to cover up Flintoff's injuries as aggressively as they did, but need to quit being such an obtuse corporation and announce whether or not Top Gear has indeed, as I suspect it to be, finished. Because at this point there is no dignity left over what the programme has turned into. The BBC had more than a plethora of opportunities to realise their attempts at chasing further gold were fruitless, and ought to have just cut their losses whilst the going was still relatively good. Considering how infamously bad Top Gear America was that BBC America pulled the plug after just one season and made it Motor Trend's problem, the fact the UK's Top Gear made it to 11 series more than were surplus to the original requirements showed just how much endless, undying faith the BBC had that Top Gear could be restarted, that if you beat the dead horse hard enough, it could be brought back to life. And since that evidently hasn't happened, it doesn't seem they have any sort of valid answer outside of throwing in the towel, ending the show in as tasteful a manner as they can, and work on making people forget the past seven years of Top Gear ever occurred, for the benefit of just about everyone who enjoyed the show past or present. Because to me, even if you are a fan of the current format, what the BBC did is utterly indefensible. When you have a history of treating your hosting team like replaceable parts in a machine, you cannot act surprised when one of those parts ends up breaking beyond usability because of your cavalier attitude towards safety and valuing star power over passion and raw skill. Whatever happens to Top Gear from here on in, the program can only serve as a valuable lesson in how not to treat your on-screen talent. We shall see what happens in the future, but I personally wouldn't hold my breath. With that out the way, there's a couple of things I'd like to announce. Since September, I have finally launched a Twitter account with the assistance of some close colleagues owing to the fact that for some reason my IP address just does not like signing up to the website. And I did this because I feel it's finally time to start getting serious in regards to my large overarching Top Gear project I've spent the past few years working on. Here is where I'll post updates on future videos such as the upcoming Richard Hammond documentary as well as my side projects, some of which I've been working on for a long time now. Said Twitter account didn't get off to the best possible start as it turned out none other than famed Top Gear scriptwriter Richard Porter had seen my video and rather than keep silent and say nothing at all when you have nothing nice to say, he decided to have this little temper tantrum because I apparently got the network that airs Downton Abbey wrong even though on an international scale, which is what I was primarily focusing on, essentially everything from Abbey to Bake Off goes through BBC America at some point, because ITV, Channel 4 and Channel 5 do not have the same international deals in place that the BBC do. The way Porter reacted to the video actually bummed me out for quite a while because for a man of 43 who's already made his millions in the first half of his life and has all the time in the world to appreciate much more finer things than the videos someone like me puts out, his lack of maturity and professionalism was not the sort of thing I expected at all. That said, if he wants to apologise and admit he grossly overreacted, I'd have no problem with that. Considering I've never even set foot within the BBC, nor have I ever claimed to be an official correspondent for Top Gear, I'm not quite sure what his problem is outside of an easily damaged ego. That's all I have to say on that particular matter. The whole reason I made this video and the one before it in the first place was because of how comparatively invisible serious online discourse regarding Top Gear post-2015 has been for the majority of its run against the very brief time Chris Evans was a host, but not really criticising its entire raison d'etre beyond that. The fact that Top Gear continued to exist because the BBC knew people liked Top Gear a lot, they knew Top Gear made them a lot of money, and they knew the creative forces behind what had become Top Gear were about to make a new company a hell of a lot more money. As a person, I will never blindly defend the actions of what Jeremy Clarkson did on that fateful night in March 2015, but when you contextualise what was happening at the time, as well as the fact that BBC have inarguably come off worse than the show's former star presenters ever did, you really can't blame him. The show might have been called Top Gear, incidentally the same name as a program that had existed since the 1970s and had even had much of the same people working on it, but once you acknowledge the sheer amount of work Clarkson, Willman and the rest of his team put into totally reinventing it from the ground up, do you realise it was never going to be anyone else's show? Clarkson might not have been the first person in the world to savage cars in the manner LJK Setright had pioneered decades earlier, but he was the first person to successfully translate that savagery onto the screen, as well as combine a number of other elements he devised over the course of years into one singular package. Top Gear's presentation style will forever remain unique because not only is it a product of its era, but it's a product that defined its era. 
an era synonymous with Panda Pops, PlayStation 2's interactive red buttons, magazine order ringtones, and when British indie dominated the charts no matter where you were. And when you try and take it out of that era, it doesn't really work. As always, thanks to everyone who supported me through Ko-Fi, Patreon, and all the other sources through this rather trying time. Check the description and any pinned comments for further information I may append in the coming days, as well as the aforementioned Twitter, and I'll see you all in the next video.